My next tip is to show up. Woody Allen said that 80% of success in life is just showing up. Woody Allen also married his stepdaughter, so we should be careful what advice we take from Woody Allen. Uh, but in this case, I think he was, I think he was right. So good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Luke Chant, who is the owner of Hotwire Heating, and he's based over in Melbourne. And we actually met through a community called Business Blueprint. And I saw Luke do his talk up on stage in, it was in Fiji, wasn't it? And just yeah, loved yeah. what he was talking about and said, hey, you know, you should come and join me on the podcast. So Luke, thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. So you've got quite an interesting story in terms of your business and where it's come from, where we have got to. Why don't you just give a, a little bit of a teaser in terms of take us through your be, um, best professional, best and personal best so far in your life? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, from a business point of view, I've, uh, I've had a couple of rather spectacular business failures before this one. Um, so we <laughs> wear the bruises and uh, yeah. et cetera of of that um so i've certainly been uh been on that side of things uh, as we well both for, yep <laughs> for this uh, yeah so I've, at a personal level i've actually done all sorts of things i was uh, i was training the olympics and rowing once so um really? I've played, I've played semi-professional soccer um i've uh from a non-profit point of view done all sorts of different things run uh run help running camps for youth uh um i even even spent a short amount of time in jail um that was to run one of those courses not to you know because they didn't think bad but um it does it does get the exact reaction that you just gave um <laughs> but for a, for a for a good little middle class white boy having a having a uh a, a two or three jail was a pretty eye-opening experience um yeah. as, as well um so i've done all sorts of different things um over the years and then i got into got into this business um uh nearly 20 years ago uh, nearly 20 years ago now and uh and we've been, uh, look, uh, moderately successful. I, I wrote an article which was called 10 Steps to Business Success by a Moderately Successful Business Owner, which is the origin of what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's really, um, ironically, been been a really successful article. Uh, and, <laughs> and I've been interviewed on a few different podcasts and, as you said, given a talk at a uh, at an international business conference as well. So it's, yeah. um, it's interesting how these things happen. It is wonderful. So it's been 20 years now. Wow. Yeah, and, so it started in 2004, yeah, so nearly 20 years. And why did you, why this business? I had two business partners uh, early on, uh, yeah. and one of one of them was actually looking to find an underfloor heating product in Australia they were happy with, and they yep. couldn't find one, and they found one in New Zealand that they liked, and so they thought that if there was, um, if that was their experience, it might be other people's experience as well, uh, and so they started a business um, to distribute that product in Australia, and then after about six months, I came on board. Excellent. Okay. So 10 tips from a moderately successful businessman. Let's let's yeah. get started. Share us, <laughs> share them with us, please. Sure. So the origin is I was actually sitting around a fire in our backyard with a friend of mine, and he uh he was he'd been in sort of an employee all his life. And, and when I shared some of the things I'd done and some of the risks we'd taken as a as a business owner, he was just really taken and, and really surprised by some of the things we'd done and encouraged me to write them down. And so I wrote an article and I, I published it just on LinkedIn. And it was called The 10 Steps to Business Success by a Moderately Successful Owner. And I guess because I was self-effacing in the title, uh, <laughs> that certainly appeals to the Australian and the New Zealand uh, culture. Yep. Uh, you know, we like that kind of thing. And, and it, I had no anticipation of success, but it really, I think it's really rung true with people because I'm not on this podcast to say I've I've made $50 million and here's my here's my secrets. I'm, my, my story is one of, uh, of being moderately successful and sort of here's the things I've done to to do that. Um, so that's the basis of the of the presentation. So um, and the presentation of the basis of the article. So the very first thing uh, I I'd like to say is to is if you're a business owner out there, just to be proud of what you've achieved. Every every small business owner knows the knows that the numbers we've all heard that 80 percent of small businesses are going to fail in the first few years of of operation so if you're a small business owner and you've been in business for longer than three years you're a rock star like you you've beaten the odds you're an absolute legend you went you know there should be parties in your honor you have beaten 80 percent of the people that have ever started a business so you're immediately fabulously successful. When you when you get home from work, your family should stand up and applaud. I mean, you are amazingly successful having run a business for for that long. Like it's it really is just staggering when you 
when you look at all, we've all seen those slides of the different businesses that started with with nothing. You the the uh, Disney starting in their garage, and we've seen the of you know Bezos sitting around his computer when he was a, just nothing but a little desk in a in a room. You know, all these massive businesses started small, but you don't have to be massive to to have achieved something. And the very fact that the very fact that you are uh, you've been around for for that long is is just is staggeringly successful uh, and i think we should we should really remind ourselves of that and not be caught up in wanting to be this this person that that we're not because just the very fact that you've been around for three years means you are unbelievably successful completely agree yeah <laughs> and you know and, and we can get so caught up in wanting to be jeff bezos and wanting to be these these massively successful people and and i've stood in conferences and it's great to hear those stories and i've, I've been there and i've heard them and you get and you do get inspired but it can also make you feel just a little bit inadequate and i've i've been there too hmm. uh, and I, I think it's really important to just to celebrate the successes you've had i mean i i don't have any photos like those photos I spoke about of Disney and, and Jeff Bezos. I have nothing like that from when my business started because it was small and I was ashamed of it. <laughs> and and I, I don't have it. I, I don't I have nothing and I don't even live in the same state anymore as when I started. So, so I can't go back and take them. Like I, I don't have anything to commemorate and I really wish I did. I wish I had those photos to go, look how hard you were working. Mm. Look what you've done. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I just don't, I just don't have that. So celebrate where you're at, wherever your business, whatever your journey is, wherever you're at, you should celebrate it. And I guess taking some photos along the way too. I remember when I first started my event center, we literally started with this 500 square meter room that had nothing in it. And, yeah. you know, we, 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 were, we were furnishing it with secondhand furniture, anything we could find to get started. And I did take a lot of photos and I was quite proud of the fact that I'd taken this big leap. Um, but it's good to look back on those and then we're ended up in the end where it was professionally furnished and everything was kind of <laughs> running smoothly. It is quite nice. So, yes, definitely celebrate small successes and do take some photos along the way. Don't be ashamed. Take some photos, celebrate it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, really take something to uh, to remember where you've come from. Excellent. Yeah. My next my next tip is to is don't spend what you haven't got. Now, for those of you who um uh, who are watching this uh, uh, online, it's not a, not immediately not immediately obvious. I'm I'm not a I'm not a small person. I'm I'm over a you know, hundred kilograms and and nearly two meters tall, and that's relevant for this story because. Early on in our business journey, uh, we realised that we simply couldn't afford to run two cars anymore. Um, yep. We had we had uh, we got married quite young. We had four kids in six years. So um, so my wife Natasha, she obviously needed a, a car to, to get around uh, and get the kids around to school and everything else. But we just concluded that we actually simply couldn't afford to have two, and so we sold our second car. And I bought a little fifty cc motor scooter. Now, for those who don't know anything about motorbikes, that is only a tiny bit bigger than a lawnmower. Uh, <laughs> it's a tiny little motorbike, one of those old little tiny scooter things. I think I paid about. Sounds like a hairdryer, doesn't it? When it goes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it was about twelve hundred bucks. I think I, I paid for it at the time, but but we simply couldn't afford anything else, and I had to swallow my pride. And as I said, I'm, I'm not a small person. I'm I'm 194 centimeters and 100 kilograms, and um, you know, I looked ridiculous. If you if you ever remember those clowns on the little push bikes at the circus when we were kids, when their yeah. knees were right up, that's what I looked like riding this thing. And um, but I remember once I drove right across town to this business uh, business meeting, and I, I had um I had a presentation folder that I squeezed between my knees the whole way across. And then I got there and I had to um, take my my jacket off, my helmet off, and I sort of hid them under the seat and got my suit jacket out and made myself look as good as I could. And and went into this went into this meeting, but that was how I had to operate for a while because we just couldn't afford anything else. That was that was where we were at in life. And and after as time went by, obviously, and the business grew a little, a little bit, we were able to um able to change that. And I, I bought my midlife crisis car a, a couple of years ago, and I've, I've got the big red four wheel drive twin cab Ute now that I, I don't need, but is my is my twin <laughs> midlife crisis car. But for a long time now, I just had to go. We can't afford that. I, I simply can't. You know, I had a, old computers. I had, you know, you know, we just did whatever we could to get through and to grow the business. And and I've sat in cafes with business owners lamenting their cash flow while there's a hundred thousand dollar car sitting outside. Uh, you, know, you just, just do, because, yeah, <laughs> just because we have been successful and because we we should enjoy and we should celebrate our successes when we've had them. It just doesn't mean we should be stupid with our money either. And as business owners, it's just really easy to get to get carried away. 
Absolutely. So don't spend what you haven't got. Yep. And just make do with things like you said, older technology, as long as it's still functioning, do what you can. Yeah, whatever you whatever you have to do, yeah, is what yeah. We, is my <laughs> is my suggestion. Whatever you have to do to, to get through. Yep, perfect. Okay, great. Number three. My next tip is to show up. Ooh. Woody Allen said that 80% of success in life is just showing up. Mm-hmm. Um, Woody, all, he, Woody Allen also married his stepdaughter, so we should be careful what advice we take from, from Woody Allen. Uh, but in this case, I think he was, I think he was right. I, I sat down with a, a customer of mine recently who was quite a, quite a large sale and you know, he'd agreed to use us on an ongoing basis. And I, we, we, we'd executed the agreement. I'd, I'd followed him up and we'd, we'd done all that side of things. And I, and, and I sat down at the end of the conversation and then I asked him why he'd gone with Hotline. You know, I knew he'd spoken to my competitors. He, he told me about that. So I said, just why, why go ahead with Hotline? And he looked at me and he said, you were the one that kept asking for my business. Now, I've sat through sales courses at the Business Blueprint program where I, where I met you, Deborah. I've, I've, I've sat under some amazing teaching. I've, I've been trying to be a better salesman since I started work nearly 30 years ago. I've sat. In, I've read books. I've sat in sales courses. I've, I've done everything I could to be a better salesperson. Yep. And I won this business because I was the one who simply asked for it. Yeah. I didn't use a closing line. I didn't use any techniques. I, I didn't use any of the stuff I'd, I'd learned about you know mimicking body language when you when you when you're trying to sell it. I didn't do any of that. I was just simply the one that kept ringing. Yep. And you know I. My, I guess my my superpower is is just rugged determination to keep following people up. I'm, uh, you know, there's lots of other facets of my business that I'm not very good at at all, and I hire other people to do. But, but in this case, it's just that follow up and follow up and follow up. So be the one that sends that extra phone, that that extra email. Be yep. the one that makes the extra phone call. Yep. Just pick up the phone, even if you don't know what to say. The very, oh, I didn't have anything to say. I just said. Have you made a decision yet? Yeah. And he went, and he went ahead with Hotline. It, and then he, and he's, he's still our customer and has been for some time since because uh, I was simply the one that showed, showed up. up. Beautiful. Yeah. So just show up. That's the next step. Got it. <laughs> yeah. My next one is bite off more than you can chew and then chew like hell. <laughs> uh, for okay. Those, um, for the, so um, for those listeners in Australia, they'll be very familiar with a, with a company called Beaumont Tiles that are Australia's biggest tile company. They've got some 120-odd stores around Australia. Yeah. And when we started the business, uh, the owner was a gentleman called Bob Beaumont. He's recently sold the whole company. But um, a gentleman called Bob Beaumont, who we knew personally, and our business was tiny. We had just started it. We were a matter of a few months old. And we had a meeting with, with Bob, and he was, he was renovating his home at the time. And so he took the opportunity to try our product in his house, which we thought was a great idea. So we we put out we put our underfloor heating uh, in, in his house and I put some new tiles in, and he loved it. He was he was sold immediately. Said it was the best thing ever, and he said, "Right, I want this through." At that stage, at that stage, I had about seventy five stores. They said they now have about one hundred and twenty, but they said that I want this through all our stores across Australia. And we had, as I said, we had a tiny little business just started. Our warehouse you could fit in in a, like a you know a tiny little garden shed, uh, like all our inventory. We had nothing, mm-hmm. and we just said to Bob, "Yeah, sure, we can do that. No problems. Let's do it." And then we left the meeting, and I had two business partners at the time. Um, I, I brought them out some time ago, but I had two business partners, and we we all looked at each other and just went, "How the hell are we going to do this? Like we're just committed to this." this this program this massive company yeah and so we started so we had to we had to um put sales people in place around australia and obviously australia is a big place to to do that geographically and we had to have sales agents immediately across the country we had to trade installers we had to just work like crazy to make this thing happen but we but we did and i've actually just today last week i was at their national conference at the beaumont tiles national conference as one of their gold sponsors of the conference uh, and they're still a, they're our biggest customer to this day, and they're a massive part of what we do, all because we just bit off more than we could chew, and then chew like hell. We just <laughs> said we could do it, and then worked out how. Yeah, uh, you know, perfect. And it's, and it's been an amazing opportunity for us ever since. So yeah, just just say yes and work out how you're going to do it later. Later, that's, get it. Yep, that's, that's my advice. <laughs> 
<laughs> makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, right, so my next tip is to put your family first. Now, this might sound like obvious, super simple, but I, I reckon w- everybody listening to this, I'm sure, would say their family is more important than their business. There's, there's not going to be anyone that doesn't say that. But how do you practically achieve that? For example, as I said, I've just come back from the Beaumont Tiles National Conference. Now, because of COVID and rescheduling the conference and venue availability and all that sort of thing, I had to fly up the conference on Father's Day. Wow. Uh, and it started, the conference started that that night. It wasn't their fault. As I said, it was rescheduling and all yeah. those sorts of things that we've all had we've all had to deal with. So I had to go, and my kids are, are all adults now, but um, but they still want to see their dad on, on Father's Day. But I had to go to a conference on Father's Day. So Yes, my family is more important, but how do I practically achieve that in a in a business environment? I couldn't not go to the conference. Mm-hmm. So it's a really practical one, and it might not sound like a business tip, but I, I really think it is. If if business is if your business is going to be successful, your family has to be in order, and if, if one is not, then the other won't be. And so, what I did when the kids were really little is I started something super practical to so that my kids knew that they were important, no matter what else was happening. Mm-hmm. So what I did was one day when they were all super little, we, I drove them to school and the school had a drop-off zone. It was sort of a kiss and drop zone. You'd oh, yeah. drive through the school, you know, kick them out of your car and, and keep driving. And I got them all ready for school. They put the uniforms on, lunch boxes, the whole deal. Drove through the school. And I just slowed down but never stopped and just kept driving out the schoolyard. And in the back of the old Commodore station wagon, I had all the stuff for a day at the beach. Oh. So I was the body boys a whole lot. And we just went to the beach for the day. And as we're driving out the schoolyard, the kids are like, what are you doing? And I said, ah, it's too hot. Let's go to the beach. And I went to the beach for the day. And every year since then, I've done the same thing. We just had a surprise day off. And the kids grew to call it the secret special day off school. (laughs) And every year they'd start wondering, you know, where the secret special day off is going to be. And depending on where we were at, sometimes it was just something that was free. It was a day at the beach. It was a picnic in the park. Mm-hmm. Um, other times as the business grew a little bit and we we had a bit more financial capacity sometimes it was a, a, at a theme park or or something at the the aquarium in melbourne i took them to once and and we've done all these different things but always as a surprise uh, yeah. always without them having any idea what was going on and towards the end of this school they actually were catching a bus to school and i, I had to put them on the bus and then race the bus to school and then <laughs> Um, of the school to achieve the same the same thing and they waved goodbye to their friends as they as they got in the car and off we went for the day and but what that did is it is it meant that so it it achieved a couple of things so on the day we went out for the day they obviously were reminded this is great dad's taking us out but every single time throughout the year they thought is this the day when I drove them to school because you didn't tell them it was a surprise day, right? Surprise they, she didn't day, know right? which day it was. Yeah, they never had any idea which what day it was. Yeah. So every every day they thought is this the day. It also reminded them that there was the day. Mm-hmm. Nice. And so it, so it reinforced it time and time again that that their dad prioritised them. And it was one day, and I'd turn my phone off, and I'd take them out for the day, and that was it. And they were the most important thing in my life for that day. And so when I had to or last week go to the Beaumont Tiles Conference on Father's Day. They had something to hang their hat on to know that they were super important in my life still. And, and yeah. even though I had to go to work, this was something that, that, that I'd done. So so it was something really practical that that I did when the kids were were quite little and mm-hmm. started, started the process. And it was, it was, it, it was really great. I asked recently about a year ago, I asked one of my daughters what I've got a, a son and then three daughters. And I I asked one of my daughters what um what her most favorite part of my parenting was and before i could even finish the sentence she said the secret special day off school because it was just me this was something i did yeah Uh, my wife doesn't work in the business so um so this was just something i did to with with the kids once a year to to show them how important they were and um yeah it was uh it was really amazing and something that i really super special yeah yeah secret special day off schools i really encourage everyone to do it it was was really great so. Love it. Absolutely love it. Okay, okay. so fam- family first. Yep, got that. Family first. My next tip is choose your business partners carefully. <laughs> um, now, we might not all have business partners, but almost all of us at some point in time will have an opportunity to um, to possibly uh, engage a business partner. Mm-hmm. You might have an opportunity to expand, to get bought out, to do whatever. And as I said, I had two business partners at the start and uh, it was a interesting relationship right from the right from the get-go um the uh one of the partners i just uh, couldn't 
we got on personally fine, but on the business and the practical level, it was just really challenging right from the start. And we got to about eight years into, probably seven years into the relationship, and it was um, becoming just more and more difficult and a lot of strain on on all of us. And and one day, um, one of my uh, ex partners called me into his office, and uh, and he said to me that um, that. Uh, Luke, we, we've lost we've lost confidence in your ability to run the company, so we're going to be exiting you from from the business. Uh, now, I owned a percentage of the business, so they couldn't take that away from me, but they could exit me from a a practical day to day role, basically losing my job. Um, now, my business partners were very two honourable guys, and I have whilst I disagreed with their decision, I don't have anything negative to say about them as a as businessmen or or indeed as people. Um, they're both honest, upright, and <laughs> yeah, great, great men of integrity. Um, but obviously I disagreed with their decision. Uh, the process they then followed for me to exit the business again was, was quite generous in, in the, in the way it was playing out, but it still meant that I was going to be out of the job so I, I yeah. spent time growing and I'd be out of a job. And we were halfway through renovating a house. We certainly hadn't started to make much money out of the business, uh, out of the business yet. I was very much the junior of the three business partners. Mm-hmm. And we were um, we were we were stuffed. Uh, <laughs> the you know we were really a financially difficult situation. Our, our house was I said half renovated. We were trying to work out what our next step was, and I was applying for jobs. I was looking at other business opportunities, and I was just getting absolutely nothing. Uh, not any opportunities. I was getting junior salespeople jobs paying, not even paying me as much as my school fee bill was, was at the time. I was yep. just, just getting nothing. And um, we were we were very close to, to having to put our house on the market and going um, probably moving with, with my wife's parents who didn't really have the space um, mm. for us. So we would have been you know, literally sleeping on the floor of, the, of their home. Um, but my wife and I are, are people of faith and we certainly prayed a lot during that period of time. And at the 11th hour and the 59th minute, uh, one of my ex-partners called me up and he said, look, Luke, we've, we've lost faith. Uh, sorry, that was a previous conversation. <laughs> he said, uh, he said we, we, don't, uh, we don't actually want to, to own the business. Uh, we've talked about it and we're going to sell it to you on vendor finance, um, which wow. for listeners, listeners who don't know what that means, it's where you pay for a business out of the ongoing profits. You don't actually have to have any money up front. So I jumped at the opportunity <laughs> primarily because I had no other choice. Um, why the change of heart from their point of view? Uh, they suddenly they, realized how hard it was to run. Well, no, I think they both had other business interests as well. And it, and it just was a decision they decided that they didn't want to run this, this business with their other, the other interests that they, that they had. Yeah. Um, and so it gave me the opportunities to purchase it from them, which, which I did in a, in a heartbeat. Cause I, as I said, I had no other, I had no other choice. So a somewhat of a happy ending, but the, but the stress and the, the difficulty that put, um, on my family relationships, on on my relationship with my wife, if it it was so difficult during that period of time that even with the success we'd have we'd have we have had since, if you'd told me when I started, when I first got involved, the the stress and the pain it was going to cause, I I don't think we would have we would have done it. It was yep. it was just so hard and so challenging because that relationship with my partners just didn't work. Mm-hmm. So and so I, I liken it to a, a marriage, right? If you're going into a business partnership, it's just like getting married. You've got to have the same values. You've got to have, share yeah. the same vision. Um, you've got to be able to, to work together in, in a partnership. And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's not that they're not good people. It's not that they're not lovely people, but they're just not the right people. Yeah, and that was a situation here. We just weren't a great team. Yeah. Um, it looked good on paper, the, the skill sets that everyone had. But when it came to a day-to-day uh, a day that I worked together, it, it just didn't, it just didn't work. And, mm-hmm. um, and the three of us have actually been quite successful going our separate ways, doing, doing mm-hmm. things since it's, um it's worked nice. quite, it's worked quite well since, but it was still just a really challenging and, and super hard sit- situation. So um, yeah, if you can't get in business with someone, you've got to make sure that it's the right person. You've also got to have a really clear exit strategy particularly if you're going into business with someone you know and you like, it's even more important to make sure that the exit agreement on exactly what you're going to do if yeah. one of you wants to get out is clear. I completely agree. Um, yep, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, my next tip is you don't know what you don't know. So about five or six years ago, I realised that the business was starting to grow uh, at a good rate yep. and 
it was it was kicking some goals, but it was also equally obvious that I didn't actually know what to do next. Okay. It was I, I just this business was happening and it was it was going and I didn't know. So I looked around and and I actually went to a, a one day free seminar by um by a guy called Dale Beaumont, uh, who which is the conference where where Deborah and I ended up meeting. Um, and and they always said something at the start of this conference, and this is not at all an advert for his for his program, uh, but he said at the start of the this this free day that that he does as his sort of lead into joining the program, he said if you knew how to take your business to the next level, you would have already done it. Hmm. And I thought, yeah, you're right. Sign me up, though. <laughs> and so I I signed up, and I and this was right at the start of the day, right? There was a whole one day free thing of all this stuff to try and get you to sign up for the program, and he could have sold me in the first fifteen minutes because he yeah. that that point was the clarity I needed, and he was absolutely right. If I knew how to do it, I would have done it, and mm-hmm. clearly I didn't. So so I joined up the business blueprint uh, program. Now, in your industry, there might be you know something completely different. You you might have whatever it is. There's, there's always something that we we don't know. And don't be afraid to go, hey, I don't actually know how to do this. I need a business coach. I need to join this industry association. I need to, whatever the group is in your field, and it might be something like Business Blueprint. Um, there's, there's a lot of different things that it could be, but you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes you just, you just have to acknowledge, hey, I don't actually know the answer to that. I haven't got, I haven't got any clue. Let's, let's, let's solve that. Let's find out what the solution is. And and I, as I said, I joined somewhere like like Business Blueprint to um to to make that happen. Well, that's perfect. Yeah, no, it's very very true. I mean, um, we often come from our sort of passions and the things that we get excited about, but it doesn't mean we know how to run a company. And so, you know, mm. there's things that you can learn across the many um, different areas of the business as well. You might be a specialist in sales and marketing, like I am. It doesn't necessarily mean you're great at finances or great at um, operations or customer service, whatever it might be. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Next tip. Uh, next one. The next one is the one that I think when I was telling my friend around the fire what I'd done uh, yep. at the start of this conversation, this was this was the one that made his eyes bug a little bit, I, I think. And that was around your affinity with risk. And if you're going to be in, in business, you just if, if you're not someone who likes taking risks, then you, you probably shouldn't be a business owner. Yes. <laughs> um, and we we had an opportunity to get into uh, one of Australia's largest, largest retailers and um it was a it was a huge opportunity for us. It, it, it sort of came out of out of the blue, um, just from a, a sort of a networking type conversation, just chatting to people, and and this opportunity comes up, and it was it was too good not to do. But it was also a massive uh, a cash investment for me to buy the stock I needed to stock their stores, mm-hmm. and I just I just simply didn't have it. So. It was, uh, I, I was talking to my wife at length over what we're going to do. I said, we have to find a way to make this happen. It's, it's going to be great for the business, but we just don't have, I don't have the money in our existing credit facilities don't, aren't adequate to, to buy this amount that. of stock. I mean, they, I'd negotiated some very good payment terms with them, uh, but they obviously weren't going to pay until they got their stock. Uh, and I had, and I had to buy it and import it and get it manufactured and get it into Australia. So that house we did, were talking about before being half renovated, we'd, um, We'd finished renovating that and we'd sold it and we were moving to a different part of Melbourne and we were renting for a year or so while we uh, found the house we wanted to we wanted to buy. So all our equity was actually sitting in the bank. Oh. And so I, I sat down with my wife one night and I said, you know, all that money we've got sitting in the bank, um, I, I think we should put it back into the business so I can buy this stock <laughs> until, until we get paid for this product. Which sounds like a great idea, mm-hmm. uh, and it was, you know, it said it was a it was a big company. It was a good opportunity for us, uh, and my wife um, eventually agreed, and so we took pretty much every cent we had and we put it back into the business to buy this stock. Which all sounds well and good, but we bought the stock and it, it arrived in in a good amount of time, and we packaged it up. In the meantime, we've found the house we want to buy and we had, we had enough left that we'd, we'd pay the deposit, but settlement was coming and we had to pay the balance of the property or we, right. or we would have lost our deposit and we would have lost the house that we'd been looking for it for a year. Um, so these started to create a little bit of a little bit of stress in our in our little world and 
the uh, the goods arrived, we packaged them up, we sent them out to our client um, who rejected the packaging because it wasn't good enough. And, and they were right, we didn't actually do a good enough job. And so they sent it back and it had to be repackaged and then sent out again. And in the meantime, the payment date and the date that I need the money for the house <laughs> getting closer and closer and closer <laughs> together. So we said we sent the goods out for the second time. Now uh, they arrived, um, they were approved and the bill was eventually paid and the money arrived into our account on the day before settlement of, wow. our, of our house. <laughs> so, and I, I assume um, it was an unconditional contract, right? There was no room for no, no, changing was, the date. <laughs> and, and by that stage it had, um, like I was never... I was never worried about getting the money. Mm. Um, it was a reputable business we were dealing with, but I, I, the timing of it um, was tighter than I'd anticipated, obviously, and we got right to the end, uh, as you just heard, uh, within 24 hours of, of losing the house. So, um, <laughs> But if you're going to be successful in business, perhaps you don't put everything you own back into your business and take that sort of risk, perhaps. Uh, but for us, we decided it was the right thing to do. But if you're going to be in business, you're going to have to take some sort of some sort of risks. And yeah, if you're if you're a risk adverse person, uh, maybe you, <laughs> maybe you should maybe you should think about perhaps a different a different course of action. Sure, no, that makes perfect sense, and I, and I understand. I actually did some of the things. Sadly, I lost all of my money, but you know that happens <laughs> too. Yeah, well, I I haven't ever lost lost at all. We were, that obviously was was the biggest risk we'd taken like that. Um, yep. where where it was certainly a certainly a possibility um but it was also risk and reward um yeah perfect you're here you're yeah. telling the that story that's great <laughs> yeah so that yeah. was that was that was what we chose to do and it, it worked out so we're all good nice uh, my next tip is to and i think i've only got two left my next tip is to choose great staff yep now this goes without saying but steve uh, steve jobs said um something i've got the quote here it says it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do we hire smart people and let them tell us what to do now I'm I'm dyslexic. Uh, I am great at sales. I, you know, I can fiddle around with the computer a little bit, but that's kind of where my where my real business skills, my real business skills end. So I've got a, you know, I don't pay any bills because I'm I'm dyslexic. I, I once overpaid our electricity bill by five thousand um, dollars. Holy you smoke! Know, <laughs> wrong, wrong numbers in the wrong place. So right, okay, you know, yep, yeah. So so I don't I don't do that because I I'll get it wrong. And if if I ever do, I have someone else come and look over my shoulder and check it a dozen times to make sure that I've you know got it got it all right. So I've got a great bookkeeper. I've got a great accountant who who I trust implicitly to do all that sort of thing for me because I'm just going to get it wrong. Right. Um, you know, I've got I, I'm great at winning business as you heard about before. Following you know been making all those phone calls and being the person who kept showing up. I'm great at winning business, but I'm actually not that great at keeping it. You know, I'm a very competitive person, so I just want the next sale, and I go and go and go, and then I I just get a bit bored. So, my my sales manager is actually ex Beaumont Tiles, uh, and so and he's amazing at customer service. He is an absolute rock star, and he he will just people just everyone loves him. They just think he's the best person in the world, and and he is amazing where I'm where I'm not. Right. Uh, you know, I've got uh, <laughs> I've got some great backup. You know, back end. Uh, office staff here who, who do amazing work and they're all better at what they do than than, than i than i am uh, you know i hire people who are who are great at doing that and and i'm not threatened at all by that because it's the only way i can succeed and, and go forward is to is to have all those people as a part of my team so mm -hmm. don't be afraid to hire someone who's better at something than you and it takes so much pressure off you. I mean, it, you know, we struggle through these things that we're not particularly good at, uh, and it takes up energy, it takes up time. You're better off freeing yourself up, get the opportunity cost to free yourself up to to do, you know, a whole lot more things that you're really, really good at and that you love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I, I'm, uh, my wife and I had a month-long trip booked to Europe in April of 2020, which obviously didn't go ahead. No. <laughs> um, but we're taking that we're taking that next year, and I've got absolute confidence that all the people I've hired to do the things in the office will keep doing that, and I'll be able to go for a, a trip to Europe for a month and just say and say see you later. And and they're all very capable of, of doing things and keeping the business running running without me um, because they're great at what they do. And that's what business should be about, which shouldn't be reliant on you as the owner. Okay, cool. Great, great people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And my very last tip to everyone is to actually give stuff away. Yeah. And I I think it's I think it's the holding on us as individuals in a in a community to support those that are that are less um you know, less less 
fortunate. Okay, less fortunate than, than ourselves. Um, we support an organisation called Southern Cross Kids Camps that run camps for uh, for really underprivileged and socioeconomically disadvantaged kids. Yeah. Um, and it, it doesn't matter what your charity is and what you support, but I think as as just responsible members of society, never mind business owners, I think we just simply have to find a charity that we support, find a community group that you can be a part of and give something back to the, to the community, give something mm. back to the, to, to everyone else in now that we, that we share this planet with. Um, there's so many decent charities out there that do so many good works that there's, there's bound to be someone out there that, that uh, you know, whatever your passion is, whatever really uh, brings a tear to your eye, uh, yeah. that you can, that you can help them with. And, uh, and we, as I said, we support an organization called Southern Cross Kids Camp. So I've actually got their CEO coming in this week to speak to my staff so that they're really aware of, of what, what, what we, what they do as a group. Um, and we're going to sit down on Thursday morning and, and just spend some time with them so that we really appreciate more about the organization that we're, that we're supporting. Supporting, yep. But yeah, I just think it's incredibly important. And even particularly when your business is small, if you create the habit of giving money away when it's tighter and when it's harder as you grow mm. you'll be able to be more generous and you'll be able to give more money away and it won't be as much of a much of an issue so uh you know even if you're small and you can afford 100 bucks a month to somebody give 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 100 bucks a month somewhere and just make sure that we are giving back and leaving this planet a, a better way than we found it I must admit, I, I've been a, a trustee for the Life Education Trust for almost the last 15 years, and I, I'd give in two ways. I'd give money, and then I also give my time as well to help with that. And, and even through the tough times, there was times I was thinking, I can't really afford this. I'd be better off having this money myself. But I continued. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it just it, it, it's the whole go-giver concept, right? The more, the more you give, the more you shall receive. And it, they... Yeah, it didn't really harm me. Did it mean I have to have one less coffee a week? Yeah, sure. Um, but it was really good. It made you feel good. It really genuinely did. Well, that's, the, of course, the other flip side. You're doing, you're doing something good, but it also makes you, the, the benefit, the return benefit is there. It actually makes you yeah. feel really good. It does. Um, people love to help people. You know, it's in our yeah. nature to want to help people. And so for me, it was, it was knowing that even though things weren't going as well as I would have liked for myself, I was still able to make a difference in, in other ways. Yeah. If you're... There's, there's one um, charity I will give a shout out to that integrates really well with a business and it's called Buy One, Give One. Yeah, um, you want to join, yep. And I, I know a lot of businesses that use it. And, and what, what you can do with Buy One, Give One is when someone pays for a service from you, you can buy a goat in a rural community. You can do this sort of thing. So every, every time a transaction happens, that triggers an equal transaction as a giveaway. And um, the the internet provider I use, um, use uses them. And every time I pay a bill, I get an email back going, hey, thanks. That's awesome. We're pleased you've stayed with us. And you've also just done this. Yeah, nice. And you've, you've dug a well. You've like you've done a different thing. And so um, they're, they're, a, they're a really great one to integrate with a, with a, um, with a business transaction. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's called buy one, give one. You can just Google that. Um, I have no association with them. I just know that they happen yeah. to to have a, a really good system that integrates well with, with businesses. Yeah, I've got a few of my businesses that actually use it as well. It is fantastic. Yeah. Okay, cool. Wow. Well, there's um, we certainly covered a lot there. And I know <laughs> I was just looking at your LinkedIn thing and I, I can see that if you just Google um, yeah. Um, Luke Chant and 10, I didn't even quite get the title right, but I put 10 steps <laughs> to success by a moderate successful business owner. Yeah. And it comes up there on LinkedIn. So if you want to find out more about each of those individual things, Greg's article is there is on LinkedIn. Sorry, Luke's it, article is there on LinkedIn. Yeah, there's a couple, yeah. Other, there's a couple articles I wrote too about um, things I learned after being attacked by a kangaroo is another article I put up. Oh, really? There. Um, and there's just a couple other ones as well. So I, I got to oh, nice. away with my moderately successful success. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> there's a certain joy to be able to write these things down and share them, I think, and have a bit of fun with them. <laughs> um, so obviously, normally we ask for three top tips, but you've given us 10 top tips. So I don't need to ask you for three more tips. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that those yeah. 10 tips. And I suppose, um, what's your parting thought for the listeners out there who are gen generally kind of established business owners who might be feeling like they've hit a bit of a ceiling and, and maybe not getting everything they want out of both their business and their life, what would be your parting kind of message for them as a moderately successful businessman? <laughs> <laughs> my, my, first, my first thing is, is I think the most, most important is just to be proud of what you've achieved because mm -hmm. even, even if you've had some difficulties and your business is not maybe where it used to be yep. or not where you wanted it to be, uh, you've, still, you've still taken a risk that most people in society have not 
have not done. The vast majority of our population have not taken the risk of starting a small business. And it doesn't make us, it's not that it doesn't make us better than anyone else. It's just, it's just you should be proud of what you've what you've achieved. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's not what you've what you really wanted to, then uh, you know, if it's not as big as you wanted, if you haven't achieved everything you wanted to achieve, you should still be really proud of the fact that you tried. Uh, and that you that you stuck your neck out. There's a there's a quote that I, I have, and it's my screensaver on my tablet. It's speech called "The Man in the Arena" by by Franklin uh, yes, Rose, yes. Roosevelt. Are you familiar with that? I am, but please share it. I'd love to. All right, I'm gonna I'll, I'll share it quickly as my as my as my parting part, thought. My parting <laughs> thought. If you if you if you'd like to look this up, you can just look up the man the man in the man in the arena. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just trying to get it up here, and it says. It's not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could actually have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows the end of triumph and high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that at his place shall never be with soul those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And I, I read that almost every day. It's it's the screensaver on my on my tablet, and called called the man and man in the arena. Um, read read that once every morning. It'll get yeah. you, it'll get you up and going. And of course, that that sort of um, fed into all the work that Brené Brown did in her book, Daring Greatly, was actually from absolutely. that particular quote. And she talked about vulnerability. And you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that we're often quite hard on ourselves as entrepreneurs because yeah. we have such high expectations of ourselves and people around us, and, and we don't take enough time to celebrate those small wins. And I think you're absolutely spot on. It, mm. It's important that we actually are kind to ourselves and actually recognize the things that we have done that like you said most other people have not actually put themselves out there and done that yeah yeah so thank you what a wonderful way to finish hey look um apart from obviously finding your article online luke how could people get in contact with you if they wanted to either get some underfloor heating or if they wanted yeah. to um just talk to you about life the universe and everything yeah so linkedin is probably the easiest way it's the uh, easiest way to internationally yep. particularly with the with your audience in new zealand as well as australia to, to find me um i don't think there's any other luke chance on linkedin um uh, but i think if, if, even if you just search for luke chant moderately you'll probably find me now. <laughs> it did it came up pretty quickly so it's great <laughs> uh, so yeah my business is hot wire heating um we provide yep. floor heating and, and heated shower hours and uh, distribute distribute around australia um right. so yeah if uh, anyone's uh, anyone's out, out there in that uh selling those sorts of products i'd certainly be happy to talk to you Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much for giving me your time. Really appreciate it. Um, nice. I shall look forward to seeing you at the next Business Blueprint Conference and, yeah, and yeah. Um, look forward to seeing more of your writing as well. So keep it up. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah.